Hello, BookTube. I recently got an email from the friends of the Boston Public Library announcing that the book sale, the Boston Public Library's book sale, was back in business and would be held uh, today uh, at the BPL's great grand old building in one of the many, many open rooms that are available there. Uh, and I agonized over whether or not to go. I might have gone the last couple of times that they had one. They've been sort of rare because of the, uh, because of COVID. But I, the last couple of times I went, I was not pleased. It, they were they were absolutely infested with book dealers looking for two penny profits on eBay and being a holes while they do it. Uh, and so I thought that I would give it a miss. And the last time that I got an email from the the friends of the library saying that there would be a sale, I thought, well, you know, the, I feel disappointed that I don't get to go, that I, that I don't want to go, that I know that I'll be more irritated than pleased if I do. So I, in an odd way, the way that makes no sense, I feel like I'm deprived of a book shopping opportunity. So the last time that I got one of those emails, I decided, well, I won't go to the Boston Public Library book sale, but I will go to the Brattle. I will make a trip to the Brattle bookshop, an unplanned trip as a kind of compensation for the fact that I can't go to the BPL. Uh, and those of you who are maybe new to the channel, the Brattle is a great used bookstore in Boston. They're very old. I have been a customer of theirs for a very long time. And uh, they have uh, three floors and a steady, active turnover of books and also a sale lot outdoors and right next to the shop. That's thousands more books. It's not just one cart or two. It's thousands and thousands of books for $1, $3, or $5 with no organization other than the price. So you really have to do, you really have to look at every book. Uh, I love the Brattle. I go all the time. I've already been, uh, but I thought I, if I'm going to skip the Boston Public Library, I owe myself a Brattle trip. So I went uh, to the Brattle. I settled the bean. I tried my best to console her. She doesn't come with me. She doesn't particularly like taking the subway. And I know that if she were at the Brattle, she would want to jump up on everybody and greet them and scream at them if they don't pet her. And on dog walks, that's fine, because you're walking down the street, everybody's going in their separate directions, and it is adorable. It is really, really adorable. I've never had anybody say, oh, that's gross. But... When you're shopping for books, when you're there and you're having a communing experience, I, I can't help but think there are a lot of people who might not like that. No matter how much they think she's adorable, they might not like needing to pay attention to her because she doesn't take no for an answer. <laughs> so so she didn't come with me. Uh, but I did go. Uh, and I shopped around. It was a beautiful, beautiful morning. Cool, without being cold. No hint of winter in the air. Uh, so that perfect for browsing outside. I often confuse people who don't know about the Brattle when they say, oh, you know, did you go? I go. Uh, they say, did you go use book hunting this weekend? And I say, no, it was raining. And they're like, what does what difference does that make? Well, it makes a big difference because I I am a creature of the outdoor lot to such an extent that people can find me there. What if one of you found me there just recently? <laughs> Just wandered over to the rattle, and there I was. And that often happens. I am a creature of the outdoor a lot. The sale, the prices inside the shop are great. But I, I love just browsing outside. So, And it was perfect weather for it. So I went, and I got a pile of books. <laughs> just a pile of books. And I want to show them to you. We'll start with some mass market paperbacks, including, uh, well, I want to say the find of the day, but there are a couple of things here that are finds of the day. Uh, but this is something from Bantam from, oh, wow, this must be 70 years ago. 1978. Uh, I had this. I, I bought this when it came out in 1978. I spent $1.95 of hard-earned money on it. And I have not seen it since. And I've always wanted to. I, I really like this edition. This is uh, uh, an edition that's put together by the fantasy author Andrew Offutt of King Kull, of Robert E. Howard's King Kull. Kull, the fabulous warrior king, with this great cover. And the cover is a poster. You're, you're actually told, I and mean, this won't work anymore, but you're told how you can order a full-size poster of this, of this print, which, you know, I might have done back in the day. I'm, you can't do it anymore. But uh, it, it's, not just, it's not just that, right? It's, it's this as well. So it, it does make for a good poster. And this, this is, collects all of Robert E. Howard's stories about King Cull, uh, who I really like. I really, really enjoy him as a, as a Robert E. Howard character. Uh, he's a little bit a little bit unlike Conan. He takes place in a different time period in Robert E. Howard's fantasy past, and he's also different in that he is stationary. He's a king. He has a, a supporting cast. 
And the cast is really interesting. He, he still managed to have adventures. And before he became king, he had plenty of adventures as a slave, as a pirate, as a warrior of all kinds. And they're all, all those different time periods are captured in the handful of stories that, that Howard wrote about Cull. Now, I have the beautiful trade paperback illustrated uh, King Cull stories. So I wasn't, I'm not lacking in them, but I, this particular cute blue edition, I haven't seen this in forever. And I saw it today and grabbed it, even though someone very obnoxiously stamped their library stamp onto the cover. That is what this page is for, you know, or at worst, this page. You're not supposed to stamp it onto the cover, good Lord, Seymour. What are you thinking? Uh, but I'm very happy to have the book. Uh, and then uh, for the next few books, you're going to notice a theme. <laughs> There's a theme running through here. The first one is a, a fat uh, UK mass market paperback of the David Wishart novel, White Murder. This is a uh, Marcus Corvinus murder mystery. These are set in ancient Rome and in the, uh, the very much cast in a Sam Spade kind of tone. Marcus Corvinus is a very uh, quippy, wise, cracking, trench coat wearing PI. If trench coats existed, he would wear them. He's that kind of a figure. And if you can suspend your disbelief as to whether or not such a figure like that would even exist in ancient Rome, I myself think probably not. Uh, you're going to love these books. They are just so good. Just so good. This is by far the longest Corvinus mystery that's ever been written. Uh, and the title refers not to uh, Christmas, <laughs> but to a racing faction. Uh, Romans were racing mad. Ho horse racing. Horse races in the in the amphitheater down by the mud flats. They were, they were racing mad. Absolutely racing mad. You, we remember ancient Rome for its political conflicts and its famous emperors and some and things like that. But the only thing that the people, including the emperors and their royal families, ever talked about was uh, the Reds and the right the re the Reds and the Whites, who were age old rivals, and, but also the Blues and the Greens, who were newer newer factions. To the point where uh, Julius Caesar, when he was an up and coming politician, could actually actually cause a scandal by switching his allegiance from the age old uh, Julius Caesar clan team to one of the newer teams, the blue or the green. That that would be the talk of 10 days in the marketplace. Uh, 10 days in the forum would be, can you believe what Caesar did? If you think that, that uh, for instance, Americans or uh, Europeans with soccer rivalries, if you think those rivalries are rabid, you <laughs> they are not much compared to this. And this is, if I remember correctly, I haven't read this book since it came out. When did this come out? 2002. So 20 years. Uh, I, I haven't read this since then. And if I remember correctly, this is all about that. I mean, the murder mystery is all just intensely wrapped around this. It's not the only David Wishart that we're going to see. Uh, but I want to get the other mass market paperback out of the way first. And it's in perfect condition. It looks like the day I bought it. I bought this when it came out in the bookstore and eagerly ate it up. Uh, this is The First Man in Rome by Colleen McCullough with the original cover artwork. This, this original cover art is lovely. And it's... It's in perfect condition. I'm just, I was amazed to find it for a dollar, so I grabbed it. Uh, and this is the story. Colleen McCullough was already famous. She was already incredibly wealthy as an author for the Thornbirds. And she decided to invest in a whole set of low black classical libraries and spend a lot of time researching and write a series of books set in ancient Rome uh, that she would illustrate herself. <laughs> she, she includes a lot of maps, uh, but she also includes her own illustrations of some of her characters. Uh, they aren't particularly good, but you can you can you can't fault her for chutzpah. <laughs> and this this starts off uh, about Marius, the Roman general Marius. It's long, long before you know the the marquee names like uh, uh, like Caesar or Cicero. It, this is long. This is a generation before them, and it it's the story of Marius rising to power. And the thing that was that intrigued me about this book, it's very woodenly written. It's not a page turner. It's it's fascinating and it's deeply researched. But the thing that fascinated me about it is the extent of that research. Every single little detail is in here of the the high political machinations between Rome's first families and all of the hyper-moneyed upstarts that were trying to 
infiltrate those ranks. Uh, I I haven't reread this with a clean heart and an open mind in quite some time. Uh, not since it came out. The, there was a trade paperback reissue about 15 years ago uh, that I read. I, I have read this more than once, but I'm gonna now that I have this mass market, I'm gonna read it uh, again uh, and see. Maybe I was being too harsh on it when I first read it. Maybe I'll it, will I like it enough to to go on to the second one, The Grass Crown, uh, which, if I remember correctly, The Grass Crown also had this artist doing the cover art, and I think after that it stopped. I think after that they went to a different uh, cover artist completely. Does, are you gonna tell me? Who does the cover art? Um, registrations, trademarks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, cover art by Tom Hall. Tom Hall did this this uh, cover art here. It's it's nominal. It might not survive a reread, but I will certainly give it a try. Uh, definitely intriguing. Uh, then the other uh, David Wishart book, also a Marcus Corvinus mystery only. This one's in trade paperback. This is Sejanus. Uh, not a very long novel, as you can see. Most of the Corvinus novels are a, a fraction of the length of White Murder. And uh, White Murder deals with, you know, a, a murder deeply ensconced in the world of the games, of the Roman games. But a great deal of Corvinus novels don't. A great deal of Corvinus novels deal with individual people, famous people at the height of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Uh, and as you can tell in the title, this, this refers to one of those people. Uh, Sejanus rose through the ranks to the head of the Praetorian Guard, made the Praetorian Guard into a really a political operative party, and weaseled his way into the confidences of the Emperor Tiberius, <coughs> who, despite what you read, was not addled, he was not sex-crazed, he was not senile. He just didn't like a lot of that wheeling and dealing that he was seeing. He didn't like it and wanted less and less to do with it the more, the more time he spent as Rome's emperor. And Sejanus was right there. He was right there to facilitate that dislike and to help out and to accrue as much power in his own hands as possible. He was enormously hated. Just enormously. People knew. The Romans were more or less resigned to being ruled by one of their noble families. More or less, they were. They, the Romans for centuries had had, for instance, Claudians in, in positions of immense power over society. But it, an upstart? Somebody whose family had been wheedling its way into the good graces of the Julio-Claudian dynasty for three generations? He was hated. Just virulently hated. But it didn't matter. He eventually convinced Tiberius to just leave Rome. If all of this is eating at your soul, just leave. Just go to the countryside. Go to Capri. And I'll, I'll run the show here, and I'll keep you well informed. And Tiberius did, effectively leaving Sejanus in control of the whole of the Roman Empire. Uh, Sejanus naturally went to his head, and naturally he thought, well, you know, if I could marry into the imperial family, then this wouldn't be just a temporary <laughs> assignment. Maybe I could run the place. Maybe I could put myself into the line of succession. And Tiberius and everyone around him and his family said, I don't think so. No, you're not our kind of people. Uh, <laughs> that event, you, you're going to get that answer from a Claudian, no matter what. Even if it's a Claudian as weird as Tiberius, you're still going to get that answer. You might be effective, you might be bloodthirsty, you might be a, a traitor, but are you our kind of people? <laughs> because if not, forget about it. Uh, and Sejanus was eventually deposed. I mean, he rose as high as he could rise and then was savagely hacked down, a uh, body thrown to the dogs. Uh, just And all of his family hunted down in the streets, chased from one cellar to another. Piteous people who had, did nothing wrong. Uh, a lot of his, of his hangers-on, people who just rose with him because he had power over them, they had no say in the matter. Uh, a freedman who's fairly wealthy owns a string of wine shops in the Sabura. Sejanus or a henchman of Sejanus comes along and says, you know, I'd, I'd really like you to enter into a, a business arrangement with my conglomerate. Uh, you pay me a certain amount. It's a really nice wine shop you got here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. You don't want to do that. None of that is voluntary on your part, but where can you go? Maybe the emperor, but where's the emperor? People haven't seen him in 15 years. So you say yes. Then Sejanus falls and people hate him so much that in the blood frenzy that follows, people come hunting for you. And what are you going to say at the door of your shop? I didn't want to? You'd still be torn apart, and so will your family. Uh, 
And in, in the in the course of this book, the uh, Tiberius's mother, Livia, leaves a note for Marcus Corvinus asking him to investigate something connected with, with the story of Sejanus. So we get the whole story from multiple viewpoints, including a handful of survivors. Uh, it's a fascinating book, just wonderful, just uh, uh, typically wonderful. Uh, David Wishart did this pattern for a while, where he centered, actually titled a book uh, around the name of a person he was doing. And naturally, my favorite of those is the one titled Ovid, uh, which gets at one of the le history's legitimate mysteries, which is what made, what offense caused Ovid to be exiled. But they're, they're delightful. Like I said, with white murder, you have to get used to the pattern. If you get used to that, there's an intentionally anachronistic pattern here. If you can get used to that, you're going to love these. If you can't, then it's definitely there. It doesn't change from book to book. So if you, if that's going to bug you, then you won't like these. Then you might like, for instance, the SPQR mysteries, but you won't like these. I would hope that you could give it a try because they're well worth it. Uh, and of course, some of you are of a certain vintage will see that name and automatically think of Patrick Stewart. <laughs> who gives an, um, an amazingly good, insidiously, oilessly evil performance as Sejanus in I, Claudius. I would say that he gives a standout performance, but that wouldn't be saying anything for I, Claudius. Everyone gives a standout performance in that show. Everyone does. So, so he's just one of them. <laughs> Even uh, John Reese davies who all most of you of a certain age, younger, will know as Gimli in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies. Uh he plays the uh, Praetorian Guard Macro who takes over for Sejanus. Of course, there's only one way to do that. <laughs> he also has, uh, he does, there's some great comedy in I, uh Actually, Patrick Stewart gets in a great number of comic moments, although his best moments come in the episode with the trial of Nias Calpurnius Piso. <laughs> that is such a great episode where he takes, he takes, uh, who is it, Nigel West? plays Tiberius, he takes him aside and says, he's expecting you to save him, but you must not. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, Macro, John Reese davis Macro has a great moment later when he is, he, once Sejanus has fallen and once Tiberius is gone, uh, Caligula takes over and it's John Hurt who does such a fantastic job as a crazy as, as a rat in a barn. Caligula, and at one point Macro has to explain with a stone cold face to the assembled people uh, that uh, Caligula has undergone a change, a metamorphosis. He's still the adorable man we've all known and loved, but he is also a god. <laughs> he's 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 given the un the unenviable task of explaining to people that Caligula has become a god. <laughs> Because it's not true, and Caligula is in due course ex executed, and he's assassinated in the course of I, Claudius. And there's a great moment in the final episode when Claudius is old and he's dying, and he's having flashbacks. All these people from all the hours that we've watched are walking into his memory and saying a line to him and then... And then and, you know, shuffling off stage left and John Hurt gets a, one last great zinger when he wanders into Claudius's field of vision and says I wasn't just speaking of the Jews he says I wasn't their messiah after all could have knocked me over with a feather when they told me <laughs> he thought he was the long prophesied messiah of the Jews until he was hacked to pieces uh, but anyway those of you <laughs> that's a long digression to say that those of you who remember I Claudius won't be able to to think about anybody but Patrick Stewart when you're reading this, even though I don't think there was much resemblance. Well, we don't have a completely good way to know because Sejanus, in addition to having that bloodbath caused by his his deposal and death, was also subject to what the Romans refer to as damnatio immemore, where all trace of the person's existence was scrubbed away. Workmen with chisels would go at the foundations of buildings to chip away the name. Coins would be melted down and reforged. Everything. Records. People would go in and, and just destroy records. Um, but anyway, this, this theme continues with our last, the, the next book here, which is Murder in the Forum by Rosemary Rowe. This is another Roman historical mystery set in uh, 2nd century Britain, I believe. I've only read a couple of these. Rosemary Rowe had a very uh, spotty publication, track record in america as far as i know i don't think this yeah this is a headline 
hardcover. This is not an American edition. And I don't think there were many. I, the ones that I that I sold in my bookstore were imports from New Pomfret, Vermont. Uh, and there were only a few of those. So I have there's a huge number of Rosemary Rowe Roman mysteries that I haven't read. Uh, but I remember liking them. I, I'm never all that much of a fan. I like my Roman murder mysteries to be set in Rome. But I will I will take the British uh, the British setting. And then we're going to leave ancient Rome. <laughs> okay, so let's let's get these out of here. We're going to leave ancient Rome, uh, and we're going to go to murder mysteries. March mystery madness just ended, but my love of murder mysteries continues unabated, forever. <laughs> As you're going to see, we've seen a few murder mysteries. You're going to see a few more. This is uh, the Nicholas Blake treasury. This is a three Nicholas Blake stories: Thou sh Thou Shell of Death, The Beast Must Die, and The Corpse in the Snowman. Uh, just a, a some sort of uh, book club edition. Mark Richardson would probably know what this is, or I would be able to recognize it. it I'm, I'm sure that it wasn't sold this way. But these are three little mystery novels starring uh, uh, a character named Nigel Strangeway, who's young and thin and unconventional. He's sort of a sort of a, a an amateur consulting detective. He, he knows people on the police force, but he's not a policeman himself. So I, at least one of these stories takes place at, a, at an English country house, but I, maybe all three of them do. And I don't, I don't know the Nicholas Blake books as well as I really feel like I should. I know a lot of people, I knew a lot of people decades and decades ago who really liked them. I think that the author, Nicholas Blake, I believe that is uh, a pen name. I think the author was a fairly renowned poet. Uh, and he wrote these just on the side, just to, to make extra money. I know that he must have done that because they were a success. There were quite a few Nicholas Blake no, uh, murder mystery novels. And I can't help but think that either I never got on to this series because the American versions were ugly, or maybe because there were no American versions. I'll have to look back in maybe my journals or my memory and see if I can figure out why. Maybe maybe do a Google image search, not my journals and not my memory. What is this, the 20th century? No, I'll do a Google image search to see what these books looked like when they were first hitting mass market paperbacks in America. Maybe maybe they didn't, or maybe they were unappealing to me for some reason. But I saw, I'm getting, you get three novels here uh, for a dollar, so I grabbed it. Um, then we have, uh, I believe this is the last of our murder mysteries. This is set in ancient Egypt. And I had this once upon a time. I had a, a copy of this years ago uh, and got rid of it. I think I think I found it at a library book sale. Uh, and uh, it's an, a murder mystery set in ancient Egypt. And I think somebody who is much, I love ancient Egypt. I love all things about it. But I think somebody that I knew loved it a lot as well and wanted a copy of this book. And in a situation like that, I'm not going to say, well, I can find you a copy because I, you, I'll, who knows when I'll ever see it. And I, it's been all this time since I to see another copy. This is called The Year of the Hyenas. Never seen this in a paperback. Uh, and this is a brilliant, original, and unique murder mystery set in ancient Egypt at the height of the kingdom's glory and power. Uh, at the heart of the novel is Samerkit, the so-called clerk of investigations and secrets, a detective half paralyzed by problems of his own with a reputation for heavy drinking, and tactless behavior toward the great, the powerful, and the holy, a kind of Sam Spade of the ancient world, deeply and dangerously addicted to the truth, hard-bitten and deeply flawed. Uh, and I vaguely remember that. I really need to give this a reread. I vaguely remember that it reminded me of the Corvinus Mysteries in that same way, which is that you have to, in order to enjoy it, you have to accept the anachronism of the Sam Spade character. Even though you suspect that no equivalent of that character would really have existed. You still have to do it. Uh, I think that's the case here, uh, but I'm going to give it a reread and see. I'm not going to stop reading Mysteries just because it's not March anymore. <laughs> uh, then a book by a, a favorite biographer of mine. I've read this book, but I haven't had it in years. This is Frank McGlynn, who just recently had his great biography of Napoleon Bonaparte reprinted in a, in a lovely trade paperback. This is his book on Richard and John. Uh, the two of the offspring of King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh, King, King Henry was a great and fascinating ruler, a powerful, charismatic figure, uh, and he crowned his son Henry, young Henry, king in his lifetime. So there were two kings in England. Uh, but then young Henry died, an unexpected death that deeply grieved his father. And that left the other boys. Now, Geoffrey, the other son, was dead by this point, but you still have Richard and John, both of whom became kings in their own right. Uh, 
And this is the story. McGlynn, I, I at first, when I first heard of this, sort of objected to it. I thought, why don't you give us a biography of Richard? Or even if you want to be unconventional, give us the greatest biography of John ever written. But why both? Why do both? But I really like this. It turned out not, it's, it is a dual biography, but it's also a story of uh, the Crusades and of, you know, the deterioration of monarchical power in England. It's, it turns out to be fascinating, this approach. I should have known better. Uh, Frank McGlynn knows what he's doing, so I should have known better. Uh, and then this next one is a rebuy. I have a copy on the shelf, but it's not nearly in this good a condition. This is a great book of American history. This is This Hallowed Ground by Bruce Catton. And this is, it's great American Civil War history. is beautifully written, just beautifully quotably written. Uh, but this has, it's in perfect condition, and it also has one of these library coverings on it. And my old copy of This Hallowed Ground does not. Uh, so it goes in the discard pile. I will transfer all of the clip to articles. I will transfer all of the notes uh, and uh, just use this as my as my print edition. I also have this as an ebook, but I want a, a, a print edition for the core library of history and biography that I dream one day will fit in my little book room. <laughs> uh, and finally, this last thing here is something that I also have. I got a trade paperback of it at Book Depository years ago because of BookTube. There was a trade paperback there with a pretty cover. It was reasonably priced, so I got it at Book Depository just to see what I'd heard about Book Depository on BookTube from lots and lots of people. Uh, and I wanted to see what it was like. Turns out Book Depository is not for me. Not because they're not a great service, but because they're totally redundant. The reason why so many people on BookTube and off BookTube are so devoted to them is because they don't have anywhere else to get used books. If that's the case, then Book Depository is a dream come true. But it's not true for me, obviously, as you can tell from the videos that I've shown you today alone. It's not. Uh, and I got, I got this trade paperback at Book Depository, and I like the look of it, but it's not very well made. Uh, so I just sort of told myself, all right, well, lesson learned. Keep the paperback until you find a hardcover. And I did today. This is Michael Burley's History of the Third Reich. Big, thick thing here. Just a big, thick thing uh, that has the, the trade paperback that I got doesn't look like that. Uh, it has propaganda art. Adolf Hitler in medieval style armor. But this is this is a mighty nice cover on its own. And the trade paperback reprint of this, the American trade paperback with this cover art, is really poor. It's really poorly done. The binding for such a thick book is very weak. And the cover is of such a paper stock that it starts to curl in the open air. So it was long since time that I just found a hardcover of this thing. And I did today. This, this came out, uh, I want to say, in the early 2000s. This came out in the year 2000. And I didn't fully reread the trade paperback that I got at Book Depository, so maybe I'm due for a reread of this thing. Uh, but I was very happy to find it, you know, for, for dirt cheap out in the, in the sale lot. So that it was a brattle haul for today. There's no way that I can do a Steve Pyramid without blocking the bean. <laughs> we, have, we have the Third Reich, big, great one-volume history of the Third Reich. We have uh, This Hallowed Ground. If you are a reader of history and you have not read this book, Correct that right away. <laughs> Correct it right away. And one of you, anyway, can have my discard. <laughs> so, uh, then Richard and John, Frank McGlynn's biography, dual biography of King Richard and King John. Uh, Year of the Hyenas, a murder mystery set in ancient Egypt. Uh, the Nicholas Blake Treasury. This is three Nicholas Blake uh, Strange Ways murder mysteries. We have uh, Murder in the Forum, but it's not the Roman form. It's a form in, uh, I believe these are set in Roman era Gloucester. Uh, then we have Sejanus by David Wishart. I found two David Wisharts today. Uh, and uh, First Man in Rome by Colleen McCullough. I don't think it needs it even needs reinforcing. I think it's just a fine, brand new mass market paperback. Then uh, White Murder by David Wishart. This uh, an imprint paperback. And finally, Cull, the Fabulous Warrior King. Uh, in this old edition, this old mass market that is just great. I have, there's no disloyalty to the newer reprint of Cull. It has... A cleaned up chronology and great original artwork and all that's no it's no disrespect to that it's just this paperback is the volume that i fell in love with call for so to find it again is great so that is a brattle book haul for a saturday you don't usually go to the brattle on the weekends but i did this time around i did i went to the brattle because i wanted to use it as a consolation for not going to the boston public library book sale 
so you'll never guess what I did when I was done shopping at the Prattle. I, of course, went to the Boston Public Library book sale. So I'm, I, despite making videos all week about how many, how I have too many physical books, I got two huge sacks of them just today, just this morning. Uh, but, <laughs> but none of you are in a position to judge me when it comes to that. Now are you? <laughs> so I will wrap this up in virtuous silence and I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.